Okay, so thanks for being here in this room. Thanks to all the people in the Zooniverse out there. I uh, appreciate everyone being here. Thanks as well to the Center of Southwest Studies, Fort Lewis College, the Adventure Education Department here, and Steve Allen for making this on. My name is Eli Shostak. I'm a senior lecturer here at Fort Lewis College in the Adventure Education Department. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, it's really an honor to introduce tonight's guest. I've been a, a fan for like 30 years of Steve Allen reading his books. It's also an honor to share Fort Lewis College's land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land that Fort Lewis College is situated upon is the ancestral land and territory of the Ute people who were forcibly removed by the United States government. We also acknowledge that this land is connected to the communal and ceremonial spaces of the Apache, the Pueblos of New Mexico, the Hopi, and the Navajo nations. It's important to acknowledge this setting because the narratives of the land in this region have long been told from the dominant perspective without full recognition of the original land stewards who continue to inhabit and connect with this land. Thank you for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important lens. As mentioned, I teach in the Adventure Education Department. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we've been around for about 17 years. We're part of the School of Education. And we have students who graduate in four and five and six and seven and eight years <laughs> in the Fort Lewis College with a degree of BA in adventure education. Uh, we also offer two certificates in conjunction with other departments on campus. We've got a snow and avalanche study certificate, which is maybe the only one in the country or one of very few in the country. We also have a wilderness and adventure therapy certificate. So if you're not keeping up with the world of higher education, uh, certificates are kind of the hot ticket right now and they demonstrate Fort Lewis College's dedication to workforce readiness in our students. We're pretty happy about those. Uh, surrounded by such amazing outdoor classrooms, as you can imagine, we do all the fun things you're thinking of when I say adventure ed. We have courses in rock climbing and skiing and whitewater boating, mountaineering, canyoneering, right? backpacking, all that fun stuff. Uh, and in those classes, students learn how to safely and professionally manage these environments while teaching others. We also have courses focused on program planning, administration, group facilitation, philosophy of adventure education, teaching methods, and we do research. And while we're excited about all the things we do, I'm gonna say we're most proud about our rigorous approach to creating leaders and educators. And if I were to ask some of you who the role models in your lives were, I'm guessing that you might point to an instructor or an educator that you had along the way. I'm going to say that our students, when they leave our program, are excellent educators and they're incredible leaders. And they're geared towards using adventure-based programs to develop senses of inter and interpersonal awareness. And it's really a skill set that I think they can use from the backcountry to the boarding room. A lot of times parents ask me, well, my child graduates with a degree in adventure education. What are they going to do? That's <laughs> <laughs> the whole question. And I would say, what isn't your child going to do? <laughs> because we create leaders, and I'm sure you all know, leadership is something that's desirable across the spectrum, right? Anything you do, we appreciate solid leadership skills. So if you're interested in learning more, you can ask me about Adventure Ed after the show. There's also, um, I brought some flyers and they're on the back table there. You can also look at Fort Lewis's website and learn more about us. For the long time purveyor of adventures, I've learned that adventure really comes in endless varieties. Anyone who spends time with kids knows that you can have an epic all day adventure without ever losing sight of your car, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't even leave your car. And there you are, having an adventure. So no matter what the shape and size, we can always count on adventures to expand our sense of ourselves and our knowledge of the world around us. Like it's a super valuable thing to be engaged in. That being said, early on in my Canyon Country adventures, when I always lost sight of my vehicle, there are basically three ways to plan, figure out what you're gonna do as you headed out. The first was that you didn't really have any idea what you were gonna do. Right, you had a friend, and your friend said, Hey, we should go check this out. And you're like, Yeah, we should go check that out. And you got maps and you headed off down the trail. And usually it worked out. And by looking out at this crowd tonight, I can tell a lot of you have been in that situation, and we all made it here tonight, right? So good for us, it worked. Out. <laughs> Number two, there was the oral tradition, right? So campsite, campfire conversations, notes scribbled on the back of napkins. 
This was information that was handed down based on respect and trust and shared values. And like a game of telephone, depending on how close you were to the source and how reliable your connection was, the information you got may or may not have given you the type of adventure you're looking for. Right? And I feel like it often led to those experiences where you're like, did she say turn left at the arch or perhaps an arch on the left? <laughs> Number three, there was Steve Allen. <laughs> and when your friend said like, hey, what do you think about doing the long gravel loop? Or what do you know about Escalante? The first thing you did was haul off to the closest bookshop, gear store, library, see if Steve had written anything about it, grab that book, and then go in the corner and scribble. <laughs> An apology, like, we should have bought the books, right? We should have like, scary on we didn't have <laughs> To use these gold tablets, you still had to be able to interpret a topographic map. You still had to be able to read the landscape. You still had to have judgment and decision making, right? Because Steve's roots were not giveaways. You had to try and fight off. <laughs> so they are exactly what we were looking for. To this day, even with all the resources that are available, uh, when someone asks me what I know about an area, if that guy's written about it, first thing I do is find the book, say, sit down, read this chapter. This is what we need to know. Beyond the guidebook, Steve's widely recognized on the human history of the Canyonlands of Southern Utah and his Utah Canyon Country Place Names books, which are, I just, he just gifted us a pair for the department. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's a comprehensive two volume reference book that helps tell the story of the pioneers who put names on the left. So, last thing, um, there are some sign up sheets that the Center of Southwest Studies has. There's one right here in the corner. I believe there's another one back there. If you're interested in learning more about what goes on here, uh, optional, of course, you can put your name on the list to get up to date on what's happening here at the center. So thanks for your attention. Steve out. Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight, and a special thanks to Corey Pilon, who is the head of the Center for Southwest Studies here, and I don't see Corey, but hopefully she's here and enjoying this tonight. It takes a lot of work to set something like this up, so thank you, Corey. And Eli, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Let me also introduce you to Sarah Husby, who is the executive director of the Great Old Broads for Wilderness. All three of these organizations are sponsoring this talk, and there is some information available as you go out the door. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so we're gonna get right into it. Hopefully this talk is not going to be exactly what you expected. So let's go on. I call my slideshow 50 Years in the Canyons. I designed it to be a bit of a retrospective of my years of exploration, as well as some thoughts on wilderness, wildlands, the environment, and the road ahead. And along the way, we'll definitely throw in some education and quite a bit of history. Years ago, I was doing a show and a woman yelled out, who are you? <laughs> it made me realize that I don't have much of a personal presence out there. I've never been on Facebook or Twitter or any of those. <clears throat> I don't post blow by blows of my adventures and, and I do nothing on the internet. I fight with friends, I document what I see on the ground and I do as much as I can on the viro end of things. So I'm gonna start at the beginning of my craziness. My parents were amazing people. My dad was a Golden Gloves heavyweight champ, a major in the Air Force during World War II, tells you how old I am, and a businessman. But his passion was the art and the myth of the Australian Aborigines. Dad spent years wandering the deserts of Northern Australia in places like Arnhem Land and Yerkala and Willingimbi, learning about the people and documenting their stories. 
He wrote and lectured extensively about his finds all over the world. My mother came from a Scottish pioneer family who traveled from Tennessee to Texas to Kansas and finally to Valier, Montana. My great-great-grandfather, Ethelbert Talbot, wrote books about his adventures in that country in the 1800s. One of them was My People of the Plains. Mom grew up on a dairy farm and cattle ranch in Valier. After high school, she headed east and first became a catalog model. <laughs> and then she became a pediatrician. Older folks here might remember Dr. Benjamin Spock, the child-rearing expert from back in those days. Mom was his assistant for many years. It helped that she had five children. <laughs> and yes, I was in Dr. Spock movies. <laughs> And no, it was not the start of a career as an actor. <laughs> and yes, all five with mom kids turned out really good. <laughs> In middle age, mom added anthropologist to her many accomplishments. She specialized in the archaeology of the deserts of the Great Basin, especially the area around the Black Rock Desert, which is right where Burning Man is now held. <laughs> she haunted places with names like Gucci's Table and Hoxy Woxy. Mom would spend months at a time by herself in her Ford camper doing site surveys in remote areas. It seems like what I do sort of runs in the family. <laughs> My parents got the family into the outdoors and backpacking from day one. My best hiking part back then was my twin brother, Ace. He's the one in the tidy whities <laughs> He backpacked as a family for over 50 years. My mom's last, pack, was, last backpack was along the Ruby Crest in Nevada. After that, she gave me a big hug and she said, enough. And she was 70. My last backpack with dad was through the Galliero and Winchester Mountains in Southern Arizona. We were following the route that Coronado took through that country in 1540. It was a hard 10 day hike and it was dad's last big trip. He was 80. My desert roots run deep. For many years, I had a real career, and like so many of us, I came to the desert as much as I could. In 1988, I shocked it all aside. I sold one of my businesses and put most of my worldly belongings on the front lawn of my home in Fort Collins, along with a sign saying, free. <laughs> in a couple of hours, I was truly free. Since 1988, I've primarily lived in my van, explored Southern Utah and Northern Arizona. In those early days, besides backpacking, I was also interested in technical pioneering. It was all about not finding the easiest way. It was about the challenge, and it was about exploring rarely visited terrain. I did my first slot canyon in 1968. This is me in a canyon that we called Slime Gulch. I'm wearing my green high school running shorts. <laughs> in the 1970s, we started mucking around the San Rafael Swell and Glen Canyon, and then we slowly branched out from there. At that time, Slot Canyon there was, as compared to now, a very lonely sport. We had the pick of the litter, so to speak. Is that you? Um, neon? No, that is a fellow named Rob Rosine. Nearly every canyon we did was a first descent. It was all about the adventure and the beauty and overcoming the obstacles encountered. And of course, it was about being with friends. Sometimes it was a, a bit intimidating and dangerous. Sometimes you wondered if you were up to meeting the challenges. 
and one of the slides. <laughs> Along the way, I started to learn more about the land. I was I started to see and understand the destruction that had been done and was still being done. It bothered me a lot. The salt on the lands of southern Utah comes in many forms, and it's been going on for a hundred years or more. Right now, the uncontrolled and often illegal use of off-road vehicles is one of our biggest problems. Sheep and cattle grazing have historically been the single most dis destructive force. Early pioneers to Escalante wrote of grass belly deep on a horse. In southern Utah, you no longer see true grasslands. Those days are over. You know, people often ask, how the heck can livestock even live out there? What you have to remember is that the cows don't have to get fat out on the land. They just have to stay alive. The cows you see are usually the same ones year after year. The calves are taken off the range at about six months, fattened in, turned into steaks. The old cows, once they've stopped dropping calves, are turned into hamburger or into dog food. You know, it is a battle out there. In many ways, you can't blame the public against ranchers. They're just trying to make a living. But do know that when you see livestock projects out on the range, they are usually paid for by the taxpayer. That includes most of the fencing, cattle guards, stock ponds, road maintenance, and water projects. And that list includes the abhorrent practice of clearing vast acreages of trees and shrubs to make more graze for livestock. Along the way, the process wreaks havoc with whole <coughs> ecosystems. The, the Western Public Lands Rancher is heavily subsidized by the government, and very few would be in business without those subsidies. Talk about picking winners and losers. There are a lot of statistics out there about cattle grazing. But there are two facts that really are worth remembering, especially in this time of drought and water rationing. First, less than 3% of the nation's cattle are raised on public lands in the 11 Western states. Think about that the next time you're camping in cow crap or <laughs> you go to an archaeological site that has been wrecked by cattle. If you get one thing out of this slideshow, it's the second statistic. 45% of the domestic water supply in the 11 Western states going, it goes to raising those few cattle. In Utah, 0.2% of the state's income comes from raising cattle. And those cattle use 68% of the available water in the state of Utah. It's not the cows drink that much, rather the water goes to raising their feed like alfalfa, feeder corn and cereal grains and the like. Times have changed. It just no longer makes sense to raise cattle in the drought stricken West. In some areas, oil and gas development is the culprit. We may not think too much about the occasional oil well as we drive along, but in general, that's not how it works. Once oil's been discovered, here they come. In the book list and up on the Tavakuts plateau, this is what it looks like from the air and on the ground. Drill pads and roads are everywhere. It's near total destruction. This is what Pres President Trump wanted for Bears Ears. Think of that. And the whole idea of remediation and reclamation after the wells are played out is mostly a myth. The oil companies have little incentive to clean up their mess, so they don't. And just a short circuit of comment that I often get, well, you drive a car, don't you? <laughs> In Utah, the environmental groups have only challenged a handful of over 16,000 oil leases in the state. All and all of those challenge all of those challenges are about protecting wilderness eligible lands. 
before moving on to parks, recreation areas, wilderness, and monuments, let's define some terms. You know, we aren't going to go deep into the definition, but I have a feeling that there are quite a few folks here that don't know the differences between these entities. A national park is established by a vote of Congress with the intention of protecting exceptional landscapes. <clears throat> for the most part, they're designed, as we know, for high visitation, and I think they do a great job of accommodating all of this. For the most part, they're designed for high visitation, and they do a great job of doing that. In Utah, besides Canyonlands, we also have Zion, Bryce, Capitol Reef, and Arches National Parks. A national recreation area on Glen Canyon is also designated by Congress. They're managed with a multiple use mandate, which includes mining, oil and gas, and cattle grazing, but with recreation being at the forefront. Think of Lake Owl. Wilderness areas provide the highest protection available. The wilderness designation is again provided by Congress. In brief, wilderness is defined by Congress as an area that is essentially untrammeled by man and where man does not remain. Think of our local wilderness areas here. Motorized and mechanical equipment is not allowed in wilderness. So no vehicles, including motorcycles, off-road vehicles, no bicycles because they're mechanical, and of course, no chainsaws. Since it is so restrictive, wilderness designation can be difficult to obtain. The Utah Wilderness Bill, America's Red Rock, Red Rock Wilderness Act, has now come before Congress over 30 times and has yet to pass. Luckily, many of those acres have interim protection as wilderness study areas. We'll talk more about America's Red Rock Wilderness Act in a bit. National monuments are different, and of course, especially coming from a place like Durango, these are probably on lots of people's minds. They are proclaimed just by the president. Congress is not involved in the designation, though they are involved in providing funds for the monument. Besides Bears Ears and Grand Staircase, other monuments in our area include Natural Bridges, Canyons of the Ancients, Chimney Rock, and Colorado National Monument. The legal battle over Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments continues. These can be called the Ping Pong Monuments. In short, these two monuments were proclaimed by Presidents Clinton and Obama. President Trump drastically downsized the monuments, and then President Biden returned them to about their original size. The state of Utah then sued President Biden for doing that. Boo. And, yes. the, uh, boo, correct. <laughs> and the state lost. I think yeah. that would be the end of it. But the state has now taken that decision to the appellate court level. The next step may be the Supreme Court. <laughs> the fate of the monuments won't be known for several more years. And certainly there will be many twists and turns along the way. Think of next November. <laughs> Just about makes your head swim. <laughs> the monument's most at risk since it's and has the fewest legal precedents behind it is Bears Ears. It was initially 1.3 million acres. Pre President Trump reduced its size by 85% down to 200,000 acres. It has now been back, bumped back up to that 1.3 million figure. Bears Ears is a remarkable place. It's not only a wonder of ancestral Pueblo and ruins and the relic way of the ancients, it is also a place of stunning beauty. Yes, the monument has become popular, and yes, at times and in certain areas, it can seem crowded. But rest assured that there are huge swaths out there that are essentially untouched. So instead of showing you images of the familiar parts of Bears Ears, 
like Cedar Mesa or Cone Ridge. Let's take a look at some of those orphan areas, just so you can get an inkling as to what the rest of the monument is all about. Sweet Alice is a high bench land that butts up against the Cataract Canyon portion of the Colorado River. It's a huge area that takes a real commitment to properly explore. Access is onerous. I've spent at least a year in that country. And just to tantalize you, it is an area that is not bereft of archaeology, just the opposite. White Canyon is a special place to me. I started coming here in the early days. A lot of that had to do with the fact that access, as compared to an area like Sweet Alice, is easy. It's parallel throughout its length by Highway 95 from natural bridges down to Lake Powell. Probably an awful lot of you folks have driven that road over time, but didn't really know what you were missing. It is a canyon complex that has it all, from technical canyons to slot canyons and to an abundance of cliff dwellings. It really doesn't get much better than this. Another wonderful and rarely visited area is adjacent to one of the most popular places in Bears Ears, which is, of course, Green Gulch. It's called the Slick Rock Ocean. It is a hundred thousand or more acres of rolling slick rock dotted with cap rock domes and balanced monstrosities. <laughs> The area that gets very interesting has been historically called Beyond the Clay Hills. It's to the west of the Red House Cliffs and butts up to Lake Powell over by Hall's Crossing. Earl Morris, the famous archaeologist that we're familiar with from Durango, was wrong. <laughs> this is not worthless land at all. Much of this area was included in the original tribe's proposal of 1.9 million acres for the Bears Ears, but it was left out of the original Obama monument and then by the Biden monument. <laughs> the explanation for this area being left out is really simple. The powers that be had never explored that country. One of them told me that this is terra incognita. <clears throat> So let's take a look and see if this country is worthy of monument or wilderness designation. And yes, I rue the day that they told me that all they had to do was ask me, I know what's there. There are three primary areas here. And again, they are not in the monument, but should be lost cowboys to the south and east of Falls Crossing. The joke was that Cowboys new to the area would get lost in its rugged maze of shallow canyons and endless slick rock. It is a wild area of incredible variety. It even has its own way. And a difficult and dangerous traverse we call simply wow, because that's what we all kept saying the whole time that we were on it. Next to Lost Cowboy. <laughs> That is, it's so funny because I can see a little bit of something out of the side of my eye while I'm looking at this tiny little picture. <laughs> Next to Lost Cowboy are No Gun Dome and Mark's Mesas. These areas have, unbeknownst to most, some of the very finest slick rock on the Colorado Plateau. Once off the access road, I've never seen a human footprint in either area. It is sublimely beautiful. You know, one of the things we're trying to protect in these areas is the archaeology. And of course, that is exactly what Bears Ears is all about. That includes the archaeology of the Navajo, the Utes, and the Paiutes, who were here long before us, Bilagana, or white men. The Navajo left ample evidence of their residence in all three of these areas with fork post hogans, stack log hogans, palisaded hogans, sweat hogans, and a sheep trail worn deep into the sandstone. Mm -hmm. Now let's start by mentioning the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. As mentioned earlier, it too is a ping pong monument. 
President Clinton proclaimed it in 1996 with a total area of about 1.7 million acres. I was lucky enough to have been at the proclamation. President Trump reduced its size by half and President Biden has restored it to near its original boundaries. As noted before, the fate of this two monument too is in limbo. My first big trip to this area was in the early 70s. I loaded my pack with everything I needed for 35 days. It was staggering. <laughs> I started in the town of Escalante, went down the river to Lake Powell as far as I could go. And then I went up over the Kaparowitz Plateau and ended up in Big Water, which is over in Page, Arizona. It was not a great place to be hitchhiking in the early 70s in cowboy country with a beard and hair and a ponytail. <laughs> but what an adventure and what an area of superlatives. I was so entranced by the area. I came back time and time again and eventually wrote a book about Escalante country. You know, one of the reasons Grand Staircase is so important is the paleontology found there. After all, this has been nicknamed the Science Monument. Dozens of new species of dinosaurs have been identified there, and their tracks are found in many places. This trackway is up on the White Cliffs, which, which is one of the steps of the Grand Staircase. These are about 65 million years old. And if you don't see footprints on the grass, perhaps you'll look up under an overhead and see a set walking across the ceiling. <laughs> or even more cool. These are tracks of a lizard-like animal that lived 280 million years ago. This was during the Permian, just when aquatic animals started to come out of the water and obviously long before dinosaurs. But here's what's even cooler. Right next to this Permian panel is a basket maker panel showing what are most likely their prints. So think about this. A couple of thousand years ago, basket makers were zooping along and saw these Permian tracks. And they recognized that they were some sort of critter. I have a feeling they had zero idea how really old they were. And then they put their mark on them. The Permian was at that time when the continents were still one mass called Pangaea. To my mind, this is pretty mind-boggling stuff. These days, we are concerned about the fate of the monuments, and we should. Please do remember that we are fighting for so many other areas in southern Utah, as mentioned before, for designated wilderness. We don't have time to look at every area that's included in America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. So let's just take a look at a couple of places that you may not be that familiar with, just so you can get an inkling as to what's out there. Most are familiar with the desolation in Gray Canyons of the Green River. Few realize that there is superb backpacking and exploring in the surrounding country. That includes the Book Cliffs and the Tabakuts Plateau. This was an area that was heavily used by the Paiutes and by the Utes. And it was a travel corridor for the early trappers going from the Grand Junction area over into the Uinta Basin. That included the French Canadian trappers and explorers Denis Julian and Anton Ribadou in 1837. You know, I spent years exploring the Dirty Devil River country. It's also called the Robber's Roost. John Wesley Powell's men named the river, and they were exactly right. The river never runs clear. Although the river canyon itself is gorgeous, it's really the side canyons that are the real attraction. One of them is called Happy Canyon. Well, the name sounds sort of modern. It was actually named by the early ranchers who were happy to get their livestock through these narrow corridors. 
the list of the areas that qualify as wilderness and are included in America's Red Rock Wilderness Act is long. And this is only a partial list. I love some of the names up here. The Moose and Two Shuts, Glass Eye Canyon. What the heck is that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the dithering goes on for the wilderness. Know that every once in a while we do win one. In 2019, 750,000 acres out of a total of 1.2 million acres of the San Rafael Swell was designated as wilderness. We can all be proud. The fight to protect this remarkable landscape was certainly worthwhile. Now we're going to change directions. A lot of aspects of the outdoors keep me going year after year. I am a historian. My mantra is history on the ground, pieces of the puzzle. People that hike with me, and there's a lot of them in here today, probably get bored of me saying that. And we do find analyzing bits of history all over the Colorado Plateau, from rock art to inscriptions, from ancestral Puebloan ruins to old cabins and mines and hogans, and from construct constructed stock trails to Navajo fast routes. When we looked at these sites, we asked ourselves, is there a story there? Sometimes the answer is pretty prosaic. Sometimes they are exciting and meaningful. Before we look at some examples, folk, folk, <clears throat> folks often ask me how I keep it all straight. I am old fashioned. I bring a writing pad and paper maps. Each number here represents a historic site of some sort. I take extensive notes as I go along. When I get home, I transfer all of my new notes onto master maps. A friend called my maps the Rosetta Stone of Southern Utah. <laughs> I go to the literature and see if anything is written about a particular site or area, and that information is added to my notes. On a map like this, my notes can easily run 100 pages or more. It gets pretty detailed. Now, let's look at some examples of pieces of the puzzle, history on the ground. And notice what we all can tie together as we go along. This old half track out on Lost Cowboy belonged to Al Black. He was Ed Abbey's Bishop Love in the Monkey Wrench game. The half track is still there. <laughs> This horse ladder was built in the mid-1930s by the CCs and what it looks like today. This is Harvey Lee, the, grand, and the great grandson of John Weatherhill. Harvey and our history group, including Joel Arnold, who is right over here, <clears throat> were tracking down old trails. We knew this one existed, but not exactly where we found it. The blue arrows point to the same logs, but now 90 years apart in time. Now let's see how interesting one inscription can get and how far we can stretch that history. And if I told you that I'm going to tie this inscription to Batman, <laughs> you probably think I was nuts. I found this inscription in an overhanging Glen Canyon. It reads, Beauty and her cat, Mickey, 1953. My immediate thought when I saw it was, huh, okay, this is a bit different. <laughs> What's the story? After a little digging around and always consulting with my history buddies, I put the pieces of the puzzle together. First, Harvey Leap sent me a photograph of Duty Spring. She is standing here with her husband, Dick Spring, the famous runner, river runner, Harry Aylison is in the middle. The next question to answer is, okay, so who are these people? And this is where, to my mind, as a historian, it gets really fun. All three of these were folks were pioneer river runners in Glen Canyon. They were associated with such river luminaries as Tad Nichols, Norm Nevels, Doc Marston, and my old friends, Katie Lee and Ken Frost. And a youthful RV league knew Dick Spring when he was an old guy. And now for the rest of this story. 
Dick Spring was Duty's husband and artist for that man Thomas. So, <laughs> on river trips, Dick had to occasionally bow out of the day's exploration, pull out his art supplies, and then draw panels along the edge of the Colorado River for the latest issue. <laughs> Harry Aylison, the man in the middle, lived on the Colorado and Glen Canyon for many years. Rennie Re Russell recently wrote a book about Harry Aylison entitled Rebel of the Colorado, which provides a robust history of this amazing man. Then you might ask, who the heck is Rennie Russell? Well, Rennie and his brother, Terry, wrote a touchstone book in their early 60s entitled On the Loose. Most of the old folks will here will remember that. Don't worry, I'm one of the old folks. <laughs> this book quite literally helped start the modern environmental movement and along with Colin Fletcher's hiking books, and reduce the baby boomer generation to the outdoors and to backpacking. And to add icing to the cake, this is Dick Spring with the cat, Mickey. <laughs> as, the, as the story goes, Dick and Duty would take Mickey on hikes and you could just follow them along like a dog. All that from one inscription. <laughs> This is a historic photo of Everett Roos on a construct stock trail going out of the Wojibato Canyon in 1934. Yes, I had to practice that one, the Wojibato. Everett was the vagabond for beauty who disappeared in the desert shortly after this photo was taken. He was 20 years old. His disappearance has never been solved. Everett was a part of the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley expedition that explored southern Utah and northern Arizona for several years in the 1930s. The leader of that expedition was Ansel Hall. He was the grandfather of Durango's very own Jack Turner. I don't know if Jack is here tonight. <clears throat> Jack, in turn, donated all of Ansel Hall's archives to the Center of Southwest Studies. Again, we keep getting these threads. I love it. And do note that the afterword of this book was written by our old friend, Ed Abbey. And one more tie-in. Harry Aylison took Everett's mother, Stella, to his last known campsite in Davis Gulch so she could say a proper goodbye. Now I'm going to slow things down just a little bit. This is my favorite inscription because it was a challenge to figure out and then it told a big story. It reads, J.H.W. This was wrote in 1881. <laughs> it's on a wall in Halls Creek, which is a large tributary of Glen Canyon in the Colorado River. When I found this, I assumed that a person with initials of J.H.W. actually wrote this on the wall in 1881. With some digging, my history buddies, Brant Hart and Jim Nittmeyer, found that J.H.W. was Joseph Henry Wood. Now, Joseph was born in 1875, so it's pretty apparent that he did not inscribe his name on the wall in 1881. At least, well, the spelling may have actually <laughs> something about it. I don't think so. So then, what's the story? What I did find that Joseph was here in Hall's Creek as a child with his mother, Josephine Wood, in 1882. Still not matching that date. After the Hole in the Rock expedition of 1879 and 80, the Mormons found that that route was just too difficult, so they immediately went out and looked for an easier route. In 1881, they found it by going from the town of Escalante, across the Escalante River, through the Circle Cliffs Basin, down Halls Creek, and down to the Colorado River. They crossed the river, and, and they ended up in the town of Bluff, which they founded. Josephine was on the first wagon train to follow this route in 1882. They're still looking for 1889. 
Josephine would I consider to be the single best diary about any of the many expeditions needed to settle Southern Utah. This is her diary entry for the crossing of the river. First, imagine the scene. The wagons are lined up at the edge of the Colorado River. It's November, so it's cold. The expedition has already faced many trials. They were literally building a road for this difficult country for their wagons as they went along. It's a bit desperate, Josephine wrote. Now it is our turn, oh pray for us. We drove onto the raft and the wagon was securely tied with ropes. The men started to row and down the raft went all into the water with a splash. Just imagine this, what's happening here. I shall never forget my feelings as we went down into the swift flowing water. My heart went faint, I went blind and I clung to my babies. Before we started, I'd asked Fred Jones to nail the cover down on all sides of the wagon so that if we were drowned, we would all go together. When the treacherous river was crossed, we did thank our Heavenly Father. Of course, one of those babies was Joseph Henry Wood. He returned to Halls Creek in the early 1900s as a cowboy. And that's when he inscribed his missive on the wall. So the inscription properly spelled should read, this was the root in 1881. And of course, Josephine's sentiment can easily be carried forward to our modern times as it could apply to so many places in the world today. It's, explore, it's explorations and stories like these that make in history interesting. Sometimes all of the pieces come together and sometimes there are pieces missing. It's also instructive in another way. One of the easiest things to do out there is cover country. One of the hardest things to do out there is understand country. To my mind, to get the most out of the outdoors, you need an assortment of skills. History can be one of them. We can add a host of other skills, such as geology, botany, hydrology, astronomy, mammalogy, and the list goes on. We may not be experts in all of them, but the more arrows in your quiver, the deeper understanding you'll have and the more you'll have to offer others. Another aspect, <laughs> another aspect that keeps me going out there is that sometimes the backcountry is just a fun place to be. <laughs> Joe Brennan lost a piece of his water pump in a bottle so narrow he couldn't get it by sliding in feet first. We solved the problem. <laughs> ah, me and Quinta really is that look of love. <laughs> what else is there to do on a rainy day but hang out under an overhang and do the window? <laughs> Even in rock art can be fun. This person obviously has something to say. <laughs> This person just wants to be left alone. <laughs> and these folks are having too much fun to even have their party hats on. <laughs> and to think that this was inscribed on a wall a thousand years ago. You know, this is one of my favorite photos, not because it's great, because it tells a little story. We found this tricycle on the remote of the Navajo country near several Hogan's. It certainly had to have been packed in on the back of a horse. All I could think of is this is a life. A Navajo child having a good old time out here in the back of the arm, riding a tricycle around on the slick rock with this view as a backdrop. And you should see the drop on the other side. <laughs> or Jim Marston having that moment of perfect bliss hanging on the end of a rappel rope, looking up at the terrain just covered. 
or look carefully below Paul Mikulak's feet. Yes, those are monkey steps. Paul and I thought we were pretty cool swimming and rappelling through this canyon, dressed in our poly pro clothing and wearing our fancy sit harnesses and sliding down Erlon ropes. The ancestral Puebloans had beat us here without any of that by a thousand years. It humbled us for a remarkable story. I found this ancestral Puebloan mug years ago. Note that it has a big piece missing. I came back years later with Jenny West in hundreds of yards from where I found the cup and in the midst of a pottery scatter of thousands of shards, Jenny found the missing piece. <laughs> For the Canyoneers who are listening out there and, up, and, and the people here, Jenny West was one of the principals in developing the sport, the modern sport of technical canyoneering. Jenny started doing canyons in the 70s and has been at the forefront since that time. You know, people often ask, okay, Steve-O, how about women in your life? The dog is, <laughs> was my constant companion for over 18 years. This is Diz at eight weeks. I call this photo camouflage dog. <laughs> and Diz put a nose high off the deck. Oh my God. And Diz on her last hike in the desert of an eagle orange in the San Rafael swell. You know, I have been lucky enough to have trodden a hundred thousand miles on the Colorado Plateau over the past 56 years. Each mile, each vesting, each night's camp, and each person I've traveled with has been special. When you love a place and it becomes a part of your soul, of who you are, you ask yourself, what can I do to help preserve all of this beauty? Today, we not only fight to keep our monuments, but to gain wilderness status for so many unprotected areas. For many of you in this room, this has been a long term fight. Sometimes it feels a bit like a trudge. We win some, we lose some. There's an old expression, it takes courage not to get discouraged. I think back to the history of our efforts to protect landscapes in Southern Utah. What tells me is that, they, that this has been a roller coaster ride. Some of you are probably not familiar with the serious proposals that we have been able to beat back over the years. In the mid-1980s, there was a proposal to build a nuclear waste repository in Davis Canyon, right on the edge of Canyonlands National Park. <laughs> Access would have been via a railroad down Indian Creek. Think of that if you're a rock climber. Or so many other proposals that would have dramatically changed the tone and the tenor of the lands of Southern Utah. The dams along the Green River, the Perunawit Canyon dams, the nuclear power plant next to the town of Green River, the Andalex coal mine up on the Caparowitz Plateau, the coal power plant next to the town of Escalante, or the ever-present threat of paving the hole in the rock road. Just to mention a few. Or you slot king and heirs, there have been fairly recent and serious proposals to dam the Escalante River, or the proposed dam along the Dirty Devil River, which would have inundated the canyons that the Adventure Education Program here uses in their canyoneering section, and the North Wash Dam, which would have flooded probably the single most popular destination for slot canyoneers today all of those slot canyons would be gone. Let me tell you a longer story about the proposed Trans-Escalante Highway. The project would have entailed building a 100 mile long high speed highway from Bullfrog Basin on Lake Powell along the top of the water pocket fold 
lost one heck of a bridge across the Escalante River at Stevens Arch, and then over or around the Kaparowitz Plateau to end up near Page, Arizona. The proposal was part of the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area Enabling Act. Except for gold miners crossing the water pocket fold in the 1800s, this area had been essentially untouched. There were no roads through that country, so this would have been 100% new. The point I want to make is that the people pushing for this highway had no idea of the beauty that they were so anxious to destroy. To give you a sense of scale for this photo, notice the campsite in the bottom left of the photo. This particular fight was led by June Bayavon of the Sierra Club, her immediate opponent, the aforementioned Cal Black from the Monkey Wrench Gang. The main difference between them, June had spent years hiking that country and knew it well. Cal Black had never once set a foot anywhere on it. The highway would have gone through and decimated what I consider to be some of the very prettiest country in southern Utah. Let's see what you think. We call this the question mark dome and the Persian wall. And I call this the river of blood. Because of June's leadership, the highway was stopped. And that incredible landscape to this day remains remote and wild. Think of that if you're a backpacker. Some of you may say, yeah, but the times have changed and you couldn't do those types of projects anymore. They would be wrong. But right now in Grand Staircase, mining claims that were overstayed during the Trump years are still a real threat. Or in Bears Ears, the easy peasy uranium mine in Cottonwood Wharf, or the uranium mine up on Deer Flat, although temporarily closed, could reopen at any time. And approval has been given to Atomic Minerals to deal, drill 25 exploratory holes to search for uranium all within spitting distance of Bears Ears National Monument. These proposals don't just go away. Every one of them has to be fought, usually in the courts, if not in the court of public opinion. Think of what Southern Utah would look like if groups like Great Old Broads for Wilderness and others hadn't been here at all. I would venture to guess that huge swaths of land would have been permanently marred. And those are the lands that we all go to visit today. So you don't get discouraged. Think of what we have won over the past 50 years. Back then, there was no designated wilderness in Utah. Now that figure is over 2 million acres with another 8.4 million acres pending. And that's sort of pending getting a good administration in. Or think of the less legislation that we have all helped pass in the last 50 years or so. The Wilderness Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA, the Endangered Species Act, the Roadless Rule, the National Resources Management Act, and the list goes on and on. And not one of these acts would have become law if not for pressure coming from the public. That's all of us. Mm -hmm. And probably the most important change is that there is now a very strong, dedicated and effective environmental and land protection movement that we didn't have years ago. Now nearly every move toward land destruction or development is being monitored and, and actions are being taken. In closing, I'd like to ruminate just a little bit about what I've seen over the past 50 or so years. What I always have to do is check that tendency to be the old troglodyte who doesn't want to see change. 
I drove Highway 95 when it was dirt, Highway 12 when it was dirt, the Burr Trail when it was dirt. I wasn't in Glen Canyon when it was a river, but I was there in the 60s and I've been back nearly every year since. And I watched the lake rise and inundate a remarkable landscape. Yes, some areas are getting loved to death. There are many reasons for this, but of course the most obvious one is that this is gorgeous country that has a lot to offer. Years ago, I was encouraged to write guidebooks by many in the Enviro community when the idea of land protection in Southern Utah was just starting. David Brower in the Sierra Club in the 1960s lamented losing Glen Canyon, noting that it was the place no one knew. So there was no one there rallying around saving it. To some extent, that sentiment is still right. Until today, how many here have heard of Lost Cowboy, No Kai Dome, Mike's Mesa, or the Slick Rock Ocean, all areas that A, see nobody there except for me and my friends, and all areas that do not have permanent protection. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but let me throw out a couple of thoughts. You're hiking to a popular destination like the Procession Panel or the Citadel, and you are damning all the people you see. Realize that they are looking at you and your group, and they're saying the exact same thing. All of a sudden, you're the problem. And it may be the ardent wish of some, but the internet is not going away. And the proliferation of that country data will continue. That cat is out of the bag. My solution, get some skills. After all, there are a lot of procession panels out there, not just the one that's plastered all over the internet. Over the past 10 years, I've encountered only a handful of people in the backcountry. It's incredibly rare that I see a human footprint and remember, I'm out eight months a year, every year. <clears throat> Certain places will need more regulation and permits. The first time I ran the San Juan and the Amp and the Green Rivers, we just hopped on. Now you need a permit. And as we most of us know, they can be really hard to get, but they do provide a better experience for all involved. I would posit that it is the people that you see hiking into these popular areas who are the ones that in the end will help protect it. Please remember that these lands, these artifacts, these ancient structures, and all of this beauty belong to all Americans for all time, not just to a rancher or a foreign mining company or an oil company. And also, please remember that it's a okay to disagree with me. Sometimes it's all about perspective. <laughs> Before I end, just a quick note on the photography. Most of the photos are mine, but several were graciously donated by my hiking companions. A special thanks goes to Harvey Halpern and to Bud Evans, hiking cards since the 1980s. Tonight's show has been sponsored in part by Great Old Rods for Wilderness, which of course is based right here in Durango. I've been associated with Great Old Broad since its inception 35 years ago in the town of Escalante. I was in Escalante wrote, writing a book about the area. The founders recognized that older folks up to that point had not had a real voice at the table in the wilderness and the wildlands debates. That has changed. In brief, their mission statement slightly abbreviated reads. Great Old Broads trains and supports women as grassroots advocates to protect and restore wilderness and wildlands across the United States. They are effective, they are powerful. And yes, 
men are more than welcome. We're called great old bros. <laughs> and for the younger folks, yes, great old broads will welcome you as well. Please remember that great old broads has a lot of accrued wisdom that we can all benefit from. Please, at the end of the show, if you have a chance to stop and say hi to Sarah, the executive director of Great Old Rods, that would be wonderful. As most of you know, environmental groups run on money. So <clears throat> here is the task. Right now, the challenges we face are ongoing and at times seemingly intractable. It's our commitment that will protect threatened landscapes. There's an adage in the nonprofit world, <clears throat> give as many or as much of the following as you can, wealth, work, or wisdom. Wimp helps. <laughs> Ginger Harmon was my hiking partner for many, many years. She was one of the founders of Great Old Broads and Ginger came up with the idea of Tithing for wilderness. This is the simple idea that each and every one of us who ventures into these and loves these areas needs to give back. So make it a habit to donate to the group or groups that are most directly involved with protecting the areas that you frequent. Donate time. Bring your friends into the fold. Membership numbers. It's what gives environmental groups power. Slow but sure, we are winning. And as a last, last note, <laughs> the desert really has been good to me. It's been a heck of a